So we're always doing a legislative update to our vision. Turn the television. Here. Yeah, it's your hotel, you should. Yeah, I should. I should. <laughs> we got it. So uh, we appreciate you being here. And basically what we're doing is we're just giving you an update on what happened to session and our take on what happened to session. And then successes, disappointments that we had. It's a very frustrating session. It was the most frustrating session in the last five years I've been there. Um, the control switched out of we had a Republican Senate, Democrat Governor, Democrat House, and this year after the election, the Senate also turned Democrat. So in my opinion, I think that government runs better when you have two parties because you find that balance of power. And we we represent Democrats and Republicans, but this year you saw pretty much 99% Democrat policy. So that's what came out of session. We're happy to share that with you. Um, we're frustrated and trying and looking for strategies to go back and try to balance out the power again. Um, Representative Chris Corey, my seatmate, did an amazing job. I appreciate the work that he did. He fought hard for Second Amendment rights. He's known for that. And he's fair and honest and got along with both sides. And so we're very fortunate that we have him here. Uh, we passed uh, nine bills this session. It was my 18th bill since I started, which is fun. I love the bipartisanship of those. I've never ran any of those bills without a Democrat on line two. I think that's really important because if the Democrats hate it, it might not be a good bill, right? Then I probably need to find some balance in the middle. I think that's where we get the good policy. So that happened. We have great capital budget projects we can share with you that we brought home in, you know, in being in the minority party. We were still able to bring a lot of dollars to Eastern Washington, which is always a goal because for decades the majority of the money was going to King County. And so our job is to get that back, and your job is to ask. So we have amazing people like Kristen Cameron, who's got three capital or four capital budget projects every year she's asked, and that's for Centerville. So the sky's the limit as far as bringing those dollars, which are already there anyway. This isn't additional money. This is money that's there, and we, we try to drive those dollars home. So we have, you know, roofs on senior centers. We have activity center money we have um, over half a million is going to go into our Golden Bell Airport so we're excited about that trying to extend the runway bring in some economic development uh, Ty Ross was very helpful and instrumental in making sure that that happened so we're grateful to him and his work and his team who helped lobby us and they'll be matching funds from other resources we have search and rescue which we're all very thankful for in our county we'll have um, some new money there so Again, the moral of the story is to ask, and maybe you'll get your project. So we have lots of projects. Um, again, so go ahead and take it away. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. This is awesome. Um, obviously, it's a homecoming for Gina, and it, it's starting to feel like a homecoming for me, too. Um, with so many faces that I've gotten to know over both the campaign and now uh, being in office. So thank you. Um, what Gina mentioned, it was... It was quite a session. It was my freshman session, so I had nothing to compare it to. <laughs> so I guess ignorance is bliss at times. Um, I can tell you I enjoyed almost every minute of it. Um, I loved being over there fighting for the 14th. Um, I am ready to go back when it's time. I am glad to be home, even though uh, sometimes being back home, balancing the legislature work, the kids, the family and stuff, it feels like I'm busier now than ever before, but um, it's truly blessed to be over here. So um, we had a lot of stuff we that we got done. There were some frustrations that Gina mentioned, and we'll talk about those. I want to turn it over to questions, and we can just kind of talk about what you want to talk about, and we'll go from there. So thank you, Chris. I understand, uh, and it might have been both of you. I'm not sure, but I did understand you submitted a bill to on 1639 to get it stopped. Yeah, so we had, I was co-sponsored on a bill, House Bill 2003, which would basically overturn uh, 1639. Now, I will tell you, the majority of people I heard from in our district were very supportive of that. I did um, hear from some other people that were, were not happy about it, and I let them know my, my, my philosophy, my position on this. Um, I don't believe that once something's done, if it's wrong, you should wait for the courts to overturn it. Um, I, I took an oath to the state and the U.S. Constitution, and I believe that 1639 violated the uh, Second Amendment rights, both in the state and federal constitution. So I sponsored legislation to overturn it. As you guys are probably not surprised, 
they wouldn't even give it a hearing. Um, it does help that for them that one of the biggest proponents of it is married to the chair of the, judi the Judiciary Committee. So um, obviously that wasn't going to get through. But we're going to keep fighting. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged by the most recent decision in the courts as it moves forward. Um, I will continue to fight for all of our uh, constitutional rights. And if we let some slide um, under false pretenses, then it's only a matter of time before they all do. And I'm not, I'm not willing to go down that road. So Thank you for your efforts. Thank you. And there were 22 bills to take your guns away. Yeah. When we got this You signed in, I think, what, was six or seven of them in the law? Um, there were four, yeah. six, somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, again, they don't take effect till 90 days after the last day of session. So we'll see what they look like. A lot of that, yeah. a lot of those details on what they're going to do come in rulemaking, which is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we're giving government agencies the ability to create the rules if the legislation isn't detailed enough, which is also a strategy. You know, the political climate is... Um, Again, Republicans don't have power, so we can argue until the next morning, which we did in some bills. We can argue, you know, until midnight or one in the morning, two nights in a row, and we can message out why it's going to hurt people, why it's going to hurt low-income seniors, why the cost of of goods sold is going to skyrocket because of the extra taxes, and we can message that. But again. We don't have the votes to stop it. We killed um, a few of the taxes, not all the taxes. <coughs> there were, I think, nine when we started. You know, capital gains, grocery tax. They were pushing for the income tax. They were pushing for um, just mini taxes. The, I think one of the worst ones was the VNO tax that got through. So that will tax the um, services. Business and operating, if you don't know, is the, the worst tax, I think, because it's based on gross sales, not net. So if you have a coffee shop and your gross sales are a certain amount, but you it costs you a lot of money to run that coffee shop, that doesn't count. Only the net sale, I mean the gross sales, the final number, and they tax you on that. So that B&O tax is going to hit um, accountants, veterinarians, physicians, and of course, what's going to happen to the cost of those services. They're going to move that cost on to us. So. That was frustrating. We've got um, we got rid of the capital gains tax, and that was primarily because we have Democrats who didn't want the the backlash. You know, when they got back to the media and their district said, you know, we don't want a capital gains tax, we don't want an income tax. So we were able to to try to you know really work with those those Democrats and say, are you sure you want to do this? You know, we can't afford this. You know, the economic forecast is that every so many years we have a recession, and we're overdue. To be perfectly honest, we're overdue to where it will plummet back down to the 2008, 9, 10, you know, when we were struggling and cutting programs. So the, the biggest takeaway, I think, overall is there was $4 billion, that's with a B, dollars um, over the next four years forecasted of additional revenue we hadn't anticipated. Without that's raising a, taxes. Yeah, but that's a lot of money. Yeah. And that's, you know, lots of different reasons for that. Um, because unemployment went down, people got off services, right? So then people who had been on government services didn't need to be anymore, they had jobs. It was because mm -hmm. Seattle's booming, skyscrapers, mm -hmm. you know, you can look at the skyline and see that those create dollars into, so four billion dollars worth, and so when we got there, we said, well, at least we won't have taxes now, right? Mm -hmm. And we did. We had um, 50, we had 44 billion, was it? And now it's 50, where's John? 53. Yeah, 53 you're billion. Number guy. Yeah, yeah, 53 billion. Dollars. Yeah, so, so we went so up. spending went up to that, and it was $5.5 .5 billion of taxes over five years increased. Yeah, right. and our, our spending has gone up some 70% since 2012 or 2013. But why? Why would you need to do that if you have this excess revenue? We had $2.8 billion the first biennium when we got there, and we could have made all the Democrats happy, all the Republicans happy, and spent the current spending and walked away and had not one tax. So it was a, it was very frustrating. And again, 90% of what, what Representative Corey and I work on is a partisan. But when it comes to it, whether you are fiscally responsible, whether you save money and don't rob those accounts out of the, of the operating budget, you know, that's, that's not what happened. Yeah. You know, they, the money was taken, the taxes were layered on, and it's hurting, you know, affordable housing. It's got, you've got a REIT tax, real estate excise tax increase. You've got, there's just, there's a, a bunch of taxes that we just couldn't stop. 
we fight all night long, literally trying to figure out a way to strategize. I was appointed into leadership this year, and there's five of us, and we would meet every morning and say, okay, how do we do this today, right? With this political climate, with this messaging the media, what we found worked, which was really um, amazing, and it's, it's when you believe in government, is when there was a, a labor bill, and I'm ranking in labor and workplace standards, so I had a front row seat to this bill that was trying to take away independent contractors. Because the other side was saying, we want all workers to pay workers' comp and l &I. We want them to pay into our system, so no more independent contractors. Well, all of us in this room use independent contractors, whether it's like mm -hmm. a landscaper or whether it's just, you know, somebody to, it's just somebody, there's so many ways that people are independent. If you get your hair cut, right, you're getting it often cut by somebody who rents a booth in a salon. And so that's the group that came out. There were 1,600 plus hairdressers that stormed the Capitol Whoa. and said, that's it. You're taking away our livelihood if you're making us employees. We don't want to be told what time to go to work. We want to go to the dance recital and we want to be at our son's soccer game. So don't make us give up this and be an employee. We're not an employee. We set our own schedule. We decide how we're going to cut the hair. We have our own promotions. And so they fought and the media listened. Yep. When 1,600 people stormed the Capitol, then you have the media, which was great because then the media told the story and the Senate, Senator Kaiser and the Senate said, okay, I'm out, I'm not running the bill in the Senate, we'll just make the House do it. Well, that was the committee I was in charge of with the chair and he and I met and he's like, I'm running anyway. And I said, well, then we're going to have 1,600 people testify, so you better hang out, pack your bag, it's going to be all night just testifying. And after days and days of them picketing, literally, with signs, storming it, you know, going to every legislator's office, saying, you can't do this to us. You can't take away independent contractors in Washington State. Then finally, at the end, we were able to meet it and just make it a study. I think my favorite part of that whole thing was there was some, a couple uh, of their stylists made signs that were, don't tread on me, but instead of a snake, it was a blow dryer. And, and the greatest part about that whole movement was it wasn't a union, it wasn't a lobby, it wasn't a PAC. It was literally a Facebook thing that started and they said, this is what they're trying to do to us. And it spread. I had, we had hairstylists from all over the 14th there. And uh, that was probably the most effective grassroots campaign I think I've ever seen. Uh, and, and that's what it's going to take to stop a lot of this bad policy. It's not can't rely on the big lobby groups and all these other people to do the work for you. You have to be boots on the ground, standing up and saying, you know, we're here and this is what, you know, what we believe in. So, so that was the lesson we learned. If you, you know, vaccines was a very hot topic and you had 900 people lined up at the Capitol who didn't want vaccines or wanted vaccines, either way. And once you, if you're a committee ranking or a chair member, you look at the list of who's going to testify. And if it's days long, you haven't switched bills, they're going to go, hey, maybe we should talk about this. Let's negotiate. <laughs> so that grassroots effort is huge. And it's what we learned. That was, the, yeah. that was the strategy. That's all we had, really. And then talking all night long, eventually. Yeah. They, they didn't, it was so fascinating because it's supposed to be a debate on the House floor, on the Senate floor. And what happened was we have really great freshman class. I mean, we talk about that in leadership all the time. We're like, we have one of the best freshman class. And I mean, Representative Corey included, they're just really great speakers. They they will stay up all night long and they'll have these really articulate speeches on so many issues. And we have Representative Ubarra from um, Ellensburg and just people, he was on school board. So if there was a school board thing, he was he knew everything about it. And we would use our go-to person. And we just have people who became experts in certain things because they that's what they did in their real job. Right, and that's what the legislator is supposed to be. It's supposed to be somebody who has a real job, goes up and fights, and comes home and does a real job, not a career one. So, I think it, it was just it was just fascinating to watch people. So, what we learned is that's that's the way you change policy or you stop policy. We could stop it, and then you know really work together, which everybody wins if we work together. So. Good. Other questions, thoughts, comments? There's so many things we could talk about. Hi, hi, I'm Doug Hurley. I have a Washington Corporation. And uh, I'm interested, I picked up on your B&O statement. What were the numbers? As far as how much? How high they went. 
Um, do you know it's 20 percent? It, 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 it's really industry it's, it's, it's specific. Five percent right now. But where did it go to? Um, it depends on your industry. Yeah, it's really it's a yes, it's right. a grid. So you have to look up which piece you want, and then you'd have to figure out how. So you get, if it's you get a real number. So it was a 20 to 30 percent increase. Depending on if you were a veterinarian or a physician or what you or did exactly. Um, we can look it up. Yeah, Let's look it up so. afterwards and see. We'll let you know exactly. Yeah. It'll take effect 90 days after session. We currently, though, we have a petition that Representative Corey and I both signed, uh, it was yesterday, that asked the governor to veto that section of the bill. I mean, if you're going to do your tax, we can't stop it, but don't do the veto tax. Right, don't increase that because you're you're killing small business, right? Sure. And that's eighty percent of the businesses in the state of Washington are small, and that's what keeps us able to live in small communities. We want to live here. We don't want to live in the city. So if you start pulling out all these small businesses, then we have to go to the city for goods and services, and eventually you lose your community. You know, the businesses are the heartbeat of the community. So. We've got all these arguments we're trying, but we don't know if it's going to be tore off. So one of the challenges that we face over there is that, the, that certain legislators only view everything in a silo, right? So the B&O tax is a great example. We have this entire session-long discussion over lack of availability and affordability of health care. And, you know, physicians not taking Medicaid and Medicare and having those problems. And so we do all this stuff to quote try to fix that issue, and then we turn around and we tax, we raise taxes on physicians. Well, what do you think that does to availability of uh, physicians willing to take on Medicare and Medicare patients? It, it hurts it. So everything doesn't exist in a silo until you go over to Olympia, and then it's like we can't think outside of what are the unintended consequences of what we're doing. Um, when you look at affordable housing, um, you know, we have this housing crisis. Everybody in Olympia, we have a housing crisis, housing crisis. Well, the reason we have a housing crisis is because we've done all we can to stifle and ruin development um, of houses and make it unaffordable. Some of it's intentional in the urban sections. They don't want you to drive a car. They want you to live close to downtown, and they want you to live in high-rise buildings. But they've made it so incredibly expensive to build anything that it's unaffordable. And then we turn around and say, well, we need more money for this. We need more money for this. Well, maybe we need to ease restrictions and make it easier for people to, to build entry-level homes, whether it's condos or townhomes or whatnot. Um, we just, we, for some reason, we get stuck in this area where, you know, we'll create our own crisis, but we don't see that we've created that crisis, and we just want to throw money at it, thinking that that'll fix the problem, when really there's a systemic issue on the bottom. Like homelessness. Too. Yeah. So for homelessness, uh, that was another big topic this year. Instead of looking, and partially we did, was instead of solving the underlying issue, which typically is substance abuse, uh, substance abuse and mental health. And sometimes they're one started the other, sometimes it's one, you know. But instead of going after that stuff, well, their, their thought process was, well, landlords must be evicting people. So therefore, we need to make it harder to evict bad tenants because that's the only reason people are homeless. So now you've created a thing where there's probably, in this room, I'm one of them, a lot of uh, landlords who have one or two units that they use to help get ready for retirement. And, um, you're going to start seeing people sell those units, they're going to go off the market, and what's that going to do? It's going to drive rental prices up. Um, you're going to have tenants who aren't willing to take any risks on anybody. Um, so that's going to be harder for people to find housing. And then we're going to come back two years from now and say, well, we have a housing shortage. Well, you made it worse two years ago, and now your solution is to spend more government money and build more government housing, rather than getting out of the people's way and letting them do their own work. I mean, in Yakima Valley, for example, the average landlord owns one unit, which means it's not faceless corporations, it's not big management companies, it's, fa it's mom and pops, it's families building up a, uh, a savings retirement. and retirement. Yeah, the, the housing was a really, there were a lot of bills around the landlord-tenant relationships, and so we battled and battled back and forth, and then it was interesting because I was in charge of that committee a couple of years ago and we came up with this bill and this idea and we negotiated for a whole year with the other side and then the minute we lost the Senate, all of those negotiations were gone and it came back. So when you evict someone, um, you have three days, now you have 14. So there, there was just this mirage of these things that make it really hard to be a landlord. You know, there's a, if they do the damage, it just, there's so many appeal processes that, you know, can't get rid of it, they can't leave, right? And if they're not paying the rent, then you still have, if you're that landlord, 
and who has a duplex, you're, you still have that house payment yourself, right? You still have that loan payment, that mortgage payment on that. And if they stop paying, you're looking at 60, 90 days, 120. I mean, by the time you actually start exhausting these processes, and their payments are getting behind, and that's possibly their retirement. So there's a lot of not great reasons to be a landlord. And so a lot of um, Representative Marcus, too, he said, I'm a landlord and not anymore after July. So I'm selling it out. Which, again, you're pulling that off the market if that doesn't continue to be housing. But he's like, I can't win. It takes you know damage to one of my units and forever to not really need to pay. Yep. You, can, you can apply to a fund and have the state pay for the damage that you did. Then that's, We're like, what? Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And the problem there is, is we use, oftentimes we have the emotion on one side and the logic on the other, and we, we focus on the emotion and not the logic, right? So when you hear three days, so you're telling somebody they have three days to pay what they owe, what they've agreed to in a contract, or get out. Well, that's not how it works. These three-day pay or vacate notices usually take 60 to 90 days before somebody's evicted. Um, and, the, you know, so it's not that, but they, they focus on that three-day rule, and they're saying, well, if we give them another two weeks, that's going to help solve the problem. Well, all you're doing is delaying a, a problem further on down the road, and you're making it longer and harder for people. Um, I had another really good point, but I forgot it, so I'm going to move You guys are like, thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Yeah, Gina, when did the taxpayers say it was okay mm -hmm. to take $17,000 a day out of the state patrol fund to guard Inslee because he wants to run for president? <laughs> <laughs> and then willing to pay more taxes to do it? Yeah, that's a million, maybe up to a billion dollar question. So we've so, actually asked. We have. We've asked them to pay for, for his campaign to pay for his security detail. They've refused. And actually, House Republicans, we proposed an amendment to deduct $4 million from the governor's budget, um, which is what the estimated costs are going to be. And shockingly, that was denied. So there's no fiscal accountability. Well, but, I mean, in other news, he's, he's hovering at 0%. So, um, he's got a chance, but, in, but in the meantime, yeah, yeah we're paying for it. So wasted taxes. Oh, it's absolutely a 0% chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When did we even if it's a hundred percent chance, I, I don't know, but right? we should unfold yeah, it. But in the, see, the problem, and even with sixteen thirty nine, it's like we know what needs to be done. We're in the wrong political climate to do it. So how do we make small changes to try to step forward? You know, I make a lot of affordable housing available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at seventeen thousand a day. Yeah, we agree. We, we sent email blasts and letters to the governor saying, please don't use our money to help you run <laughs> security. You already had security anyway. So, yeah. yeah. So I, we agree, but wrong political climate to fix it right now. But hopefully the pendulum will swing at least back to the middle. Yeah, it doesn't have to swing, swing all the way right, but it needs to swing back to the middle so we can get good policy and make good decisions too with our money. Yeah. Um, it is, actually, and again, that's, I'm not sure we can look up. Do you know so, when, the, when the law says you could do that? What's that? Then would you reach out and plug that um, juice machine behind you? Or Terry, you know? So, it's so legal because, as governor, he is given security detail provided by Washington State Patrol, no matter whether he's yeah. out on government business or personal yeah. business. I mean, if yeah. he decided to go to the store to pick up something, they would have to have somebody go with him for security. So, and that's where the taxpayers pick it up. I don't have a problem with protecting him when he's doing stuff in and around the state, right? He's our governor, I get that piece. But when you're actively out campaigning, that does nothing for the state of Washington. Yeah. It's no redeeming value. I actually argue with some of the stuff he's done lately, it makes us look bad. Um, so I think that, um, I think it's only fair that his campaign at least pick up the portion of expenses related to his direct campaign travel. Yeah, he's not in the state, right? So when yeah. we need him, he's in Iowa or New uh, Hampshire, so. It's, it's frustrating. It was an interesting session. Isn't that a chance to get rid of them, though? <laughs> uh, well, that, see that? I don't want to give them a bigger stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, 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 we thought that through, though. We definitely. So, yeah. And I would like to thank you for the airport money. Absolutely. You're very welcome. I've yeah. been working on that project myself for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, Ty Ross was instrumental. He got the paperwork in right on time. You know, kept lobbying, saying this is really important. It could bring economic development. We need to extend the runway, get in some some trade. So, 
um, he's, he's the hero on that one. So the legislature lifted the levy lid for the schools. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> come, on, come on on that. Oh, and we're still miles from a fix for education, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are. Do you want me to take up? Your education uh, committee. I'll take right. it right after you. All right. I can go so, first. It doesn't matter. Who uh, <laughs> yeah, the legislature broke a promise we made with the people of the state of Washington. Now, now, I did not support the levy lid. I'm a big proponent of education. I have four kids. Well, it was a levy swamp, right? Levy, so two years ago, 2242, this was before I was there, it was a default levy swap. So it basically said, the uh, court is saying the state is not fulfilling its basic constitutional obligation, which is to fully fund education. So it said, we are going to do a trade. We're going we're to lower the levy rate. We're going to increase property taxes to the state. Then we're going to turn around and the state will give that money back to the schools. And in exchange, we're going to cap the levy lid at $1.50 per, uh, per thousand or whatever the max ends up being. And that you can use for your uh, enrichment opportunities. It was supposed to bring a level playing field across all, all over the state. So as part of that switch, a one-time pot of money was given to school districts to go through that transition. Unfortunately, at the last moment, the statewide salary schedule was removed and contracts were, uh, were forced open for the entire state. So every um, education association, every teacher's union across the state could renegotiate. And they were told that these monies were for them, even though it was one-time dollars that weren't going to be there forever. Now, if you go look at, state, at school spending, our school spending is up. Schools, for a majority of our schools, not necessarily our smaller schools here, so I want to make sure that's a caveat that they're different. A majority of schools are receiving the same amount of money, if not more, than they were before. But that one-time boost of money is not there because it was never meant to be a recurring revenue piece. There are some small schools, a lot of them here in our district, that were no, through no fault of their own, not through the negotiations with the teachers, anything like that, just the way the funding model worked, that were going to be left short. And there was a hold harmless that was built in and supposed to be funded fully. We were able to get that piece funded, unrelated to the levy swap. It's not a perfect solution, and it's only for the biennium, so we still have to go fix that going forward. But that was at least a fix there. Um, the levy thing was a last minute, sign, right before signing die, agreement amongst the Democrats. And actually, we almost went into special session because yeah. Senate Democrats wanted levy money for charter schools, and House Democrats didn't. So the House Democrats were going to throw us into a special session because they did not want any money from taxpayers going to charter schools. And that's really a shame because a lot of those charter schools are in um, low income minority areas where schools are underperforming and these charter schools are doing amazing work at half the price and they're not getting any of the levy dollars for other enrichment. So um, that almost sent us to special session, but we were able to get through that. I did not support the levy lid lift. I was very clear the whole session that I was worried it would throw us into a McCleary 2.0 where we would get sued again for having this disparity because there's just not the property tax base over here for us to compete. Seattle can raise their, their rate a quarter and generate millions of dollars uh, to be on parity even if funding at $3,500 per student. There are some school districts in eastern Washington that would have to have $25, $26 per thousand to even come close to being even. So that's the fundamental problem with trying to use a levy to fund basic education and what we were trying to address. So we've got a lot of problems going forward. I've argued that we need to relook at instituting salary schedules to provide more predictability um, and also look at how we fund our prototypical school model. When you say salary, you talk about teachers and everybody or just the teachers union in particular? Uh, so sal set salary schedules, um, ideally for me it would be for classified and certified staff. Oh, okay. But um, at least going back to the minimum where you're doing for, for the, um, the certified. For certified it seems like it's classified that's mostly getting hit here. Yeah, well, classified, I think, are you're going to see where a majority of the layoffs are going to end up coming from within school districts. Because you have a lot of part-time workers. Um, we had enough, not to complicate the issue further, but then you have SEB on top of that, which is the School Employee Benefits Board, which is now mandating that all school districts go to one plan administered by Olympia rather than having individualized plans. And those employees that are working part-time, um, a minimum of 600 hours a year, are now getting full-time benefits that are picked up by the school district. So you're going to see you're going to see layoffs there because let's say you had four part-timers, now now you're supposed to be having four full-time benefits for four part-timers. You may go down to two, uh, just to, just to save costs. 
answer you want to add on? So I, I get at the McCleary original bill two years ago said that if you don't reach zero, if you don't reach to the level where you're not ahead or behind, then the state's going to kick in and backfill for our whole harmless dollars. And they're going to use state money to do that, not levy money to do that, not mm -hmm. property tax increases to do that. They were going to use that. So uh, we lost the Senate, and that didn't happen. So that started the ball rolling the wrong direction. And so we had school districts that were short for many reasons. And you can't say, you can't say this, this is how it works, because their schools are so different. You have middle A school, you have um, Mount Pleasant School, you have, you have so many different schools. You have Bellevue and Seattle, and they're all, they're all different. So really the only way that we could figure out how do we address this for the schools that are in our district is go school by school. And the, what happened is this session, there was a bill that came in and said, we're going to give you the whole harmless dollars now, but it's based on a formula. And we're also going to lift the levy lid, which the, the, the McCleary 2.0, I don't think is going to come in the same way as before. I think it's just going to come from the fact that if we take the levy lid off, which we want schools to be whole, that's not the case. We just want to make sure that the reasons you're not whole are going to be individually by school. So if you had lawsuits, if you had to pay to get rid of a superintendent, if you had a didn't fit into the prototypical school model, you had way more teachers than a normal school for that size, there's all these factors that go into it, then you may or may not fit the formula and get backfilled. Um, backfill again, it's taxpayer money, it's still your money, it's just not raising the, the, the property taxes. So again, there's many factors that we could go over in details, but you know, we're coming from one funding model and we're switching to a completely different funding model. You're going to have that interim time where we're trying to figure it out. That's why we boosted the school district said, here's a chunk of money, this is until it's fixed. So the school districts are now saying, well, we want that same chunk of money every year. What do you mean? We, we got this much money two years ago, now we got this much money, look at how much we're short. And we're saying, well, that was the one-time money. Remember, we told you you got this one chunk of money in order to make you whole. It wasn't ongoing. We can't afford that. So there's it, the media is really confused on this, um, and they're not briefing it the same way. We're getting braved. School districts are frustrated. We had a great yeah. conversation in Lyle. It's part of the reason that we went over so much in Lyle, because you know people were able to talk about how they feel from their school districts, and you don't have to go school by school. The big picture is that you have McClary, and if we lift that levy cap in Seattle and Bellevue, they're going to get French lessons and tuba lessons. They're going to have a swimming pool. If you lift that levy here in Mill A or Wishram, you're still not going to have the same education. And the goal of McClary is to equal education no matter where you're at in the state of Washington. How do you do that? I don't know. We've been trying to do that for a decade, way before I was even a legislator. And so we can ask you. We, Lyle kept saying, I have an idea. We're like, great, give us all the ideas. We'll go back up to Olympia. We'll set them down and say, what about this? What about this? I think we're just trying to figure out a way to do it. Did we fix it correctly? No. Did the court say that we're done paying $100,000 a day fine to the state legislature? Um, yes. They said we're satisfied with it. But when you lift that levy cap, you're making it so Bellevue again has a much higher, different education than does a small middle school. So again, there's already talk of lawsuits because it's not it's not working. So we don't have the answers. We're you know we're fighting for our schools. We we're trying to give the facts. You know, if you had lawsuits, obviously you're going to be short money the next year. If you had, you know, teacher salary increases, the the big picture is that since I got there, WEA. And I, I, I taught at the Christian school. I, I understand teaching. I think it's really important. You're shaping the lives. The breakdown of the family has made you even more critical. Your job is harder. You're, you're bringing in you know, disabled students, and you've got families who have opioid issues, and you're having to deal with that in your classroom and teach. And then we added later. I get, I get the picture. It's, it's difficult, and we really thank you for teaching and, and making that your life. It, the problem is that we've, we've got to figure out a way to where the WEA used to come to us every day and knock on my door and say, I want a meeting, I want a meeting. And they would say, you need to give teacher raises, you need to give teacher raises. And we said, okay, well, we'll look at the budget. We agree that you should make a lot of money because you're doing really great work. And then the people in the school district were saying, 
you're doing an awful job of allocating money to special ed. You're telling us how to spend our money, or we don't want we don't want you to do that or do this. So the legislature said, okay, here's your pot of money, here's yours, here's yours, here's yours. You do it. We're out. So this was the first time in five years WA didn't come to my door because they were at your door. They were with your superintendents, and they were bullying them to get from a three percent, we're told, to a thirty-six percent raise overnight which was totally unsustainable. The school districts didn't have the money, they just didn't want them to walk out. So they've promised these huge raises to teachers to the tune of, and you can look it up, we have Kits of Sun, if you Google that, they did a story on every teacher's salary in the state of Washington. And you're looking at, even in Golden Dome, 92,000 plus 15,000 for benefits. That's over 100,000 in the school. So it's not that we don't think you should make a lot of money, it's just can we afford that? So look up teacher salaries, look up what you got before McClary, what you got after McClary. You know, make sure that before we tell the story in the media how the legislature's fault, which we didn't have control. One, as a Republican, we had no control to give even a dollar back to schools. And two, it's it's it was it, it fell back in your lap because we kept hearing over and over. Legislature's doing it wrong. Legislature's fault. We don't have money for this or that. So it was an interesting session. It was really frustrating that the school, there was some great things that came out in the education committee, and that's your committee. One was special ed. You know, the state was not fully funding special ed. It wasn't. We weren't doing a good job of that. So now we are. So whatever dollars you were spending and backfilling into your special ed programs, there's a lot of schools that have more special ed than others. Now the state's picking it up. So take that off of your debt, right? Um, counselors. I mean, there's, there's lots of different areas where great things did happen under Democrat control. It's not a partisan issue. Ed education is not partisan. The battles become partisan, and it gets in the way of the policy. So if we can get that aside, I think we can get to a good place. But again, you're coming from one funding model to another. It's going to be messy for a while, and if you have a solution, I guarantee you, Rep. Corey and I would love to hear it and take it back. It's your committee, even. So you can... Yeah, right. well, yeah. and all this data is public, so you can go to um, the OSPI's website, if you go to it's k12.wa.us, Correct. Um, you can see what the funding models were pre-McCleary and post-McCleary, um, and all, and you can see teacher salaries, you can drill down to, I can go look up my second grade teacher and see how much they make, um, it's all public data. Um, so, one thing on the more political side of the issue is, the WEA had this really nice interactive website where you could see all the salary raises across the state. You go click on individual districts and see the percentages. They were very proud of it. The whole state was green with all these dollar signs for the raises. Uh, and then once it kind of broke in April that all these school districts were facing these huge budget shortfalls and the reduction in workforces were going out, all of a sudden that website disappeared, or that piece of the website disappeared. So. Um, I definitely think there's a correlation to some of the budget shortfalls we're seeing with some of these um, extreme salary increases. Um, so we need to figure out a way to go back to fixing the prototypical school model, um, the salary mix schedule, it's a variety of stuff that we need to address, so we're not done. Yeah, we have a, that's a really long answer to your question. No. Just... But it's a really complicated <laughs> issue, is. and it's changing by the minute. And honestly, school districts are coming up and asking us, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to fix this? How are you going to fix this? We had no idea. Because the education bill happened at 1 to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning the night before we adjourned. Yeah. And we didn't see it. That We didn't see the operating budget, which was 880 pages, until the last hours. So how do you, you know, it's, it's frustrating when you don't have control. Because we have to come back and be accountable, and we can just fight and tell stories about how this is going to hurt you in small towns. and really fight for Eastern Washington when, honestly, I feel like after this session that the voice of East, Eastern Washington got quieter. I think the control with the seat shifts that happened at the election made the other side, the King County, the Seattle, much stronger. And so it's really, it's disappointing. I mean, we had a loud voice over here and we were fighting and doing great things. And then after this session, you know, it was just that they had control. They were doing Seattle politics here, and we didn't have the votes to stop it. So you know, there's a lot of not in my backyard there as well. Um, so, for example, we have a huge wolf problem in eastern Washington, and we've been trying to address it for a long time. Um, and so, uh, Representative Kratz from the seventh district introduced a bill 
to relocate some of those wolves to Bainbridge Island because it seems like a great place for a wolf sanctuary. And amazingly, they didn't like that idea. So, you know, they're all for environmentalism and all these policies as long as it doesn't affect them. Uh, and so you would have, you'd have cases where, you know, Democrat senators from uh, the Puget Sound region introduced a bill basically accusing our farmers and ranchers of being slave owners. <laughs> and having to report yeah, slavery. Yeah, that was the headline. That yeah, was the and, and they're the same people that sit there and say, well, your cows are, you know, ruining salmon runs and killing the planet, but they're dumping pollution in the Puget Sound. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you think that might have something to do with your orca problem? <laughs> uh, but no, please, my cow farting in uh, Yakima Valley is the issue. So it's that disconnect from the realities of what we are on this side of the state. Apologize for using the word farting in official legislative capacity twice now. Twice now. <laughs> Sorry. We'll, we'll work at a third one at some yeah, point. Three times the It'll be totally relevant. <laughs> but um, it's that notion of don't try to legislate and over legislate what you don't understand. Yeah. Um, not to dwell on the Second Amendment and gun rights issues, but um, I talked to several of the Democrats over there as we were debating these who have never fired a weapon. So I offered to several of them, I said, hey, why don't we go to the range? I'll bring the weapons, I'll provide everything, I'll teach you how they work. So you can at least fire them and see what they do, what, what an AR-15 is when you call something an assault rifle, what that truly means, mm -hmm. and how they work. I had one person, I won't for um, privacy sake say who it was, one representative say he had to ask his wife, and I, and I said, no, not buy a gun, just go out and try one. He goes, no, 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 I heard what you said. So he had to get permission from his wife to fire a gun at a gun range. Uh, and then another from the Seattle area who was, I, I offered, I told her, I said, I'll teach you. And I said, even if you go get your CPL and you go get certified and go through the class, I'll buy you your first gun. And I, I mean, it was like, no, they don't, you know, so it's the fear of the unknown. So, sorry, that totally worked back to my original point of don't legislate what you don't understand. Right. Especially don't over-legislate what you don't understand. Maybe this would be a good opportunity. Uh, All right. You show support for the, for the two of you supporting the Second Amendment so strongly. I'm so proud of these hats. Oh, no, is it your God Guts and Guns hat? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> service certain business sections segment saying well you're going to benefit from these people going to college so therefore you need to pay tax towards them. Um, I've got a philosophical disagreement with that not that I, I don't believe education should be affordable and accessible but the notion is that we're just going to give money to college students with no sort of idea of where they're going or what they're doing is a problem um, we have um, we have a need for certain industry, certain segments or certain areas, especially when it comes to trades and stuff, that I don't mind supporting education and getting kids into those trades. But I do have a problem with, and I say this as a political science major, you know, kids going and spending sixty, seventy thousand dollars to get a political science degree. What does that do? What is the return for the state if we're spending that money? And also what does it do for the for the person that has no skin in the game when they go to school? The worst case scenario is we get kids if they're racking up thousands and thousands of dollars of debt and don't graduate. Now they have the debt without the degree, so now they're, they're in, a, in an even more challenging position. So 
So my argument was when we were over there is why don't we figure out why it's costing so much to go to college? What is, it, what is driving those costs there? Uh, is it, you know, is it the actual needs of the school or is it because there's free, cheap, and easy access to money? So that was a little bit of a segue, but um, that was a big portion of it was spending on putting in an entitlement for people to get free college education. And what happens when that economy turns and we have to cut funds and we have an entitlement? Entitlement spending is really hard to cut because it's, you know, statute, it's statute spending. So that's one area. I know there was a variety. Yeah, in defense of the, the Democrat budget, we weren't invited into the room. So normally there's a negotiation, Republican, Democrat, you come up with a budget number. They said, you don't need to come in the room because we don't need your vote. They have 57, we have 41. So like if a couple are sick, we still, you know, before it was like two different. So we're like, maybe they're gone, maybe we'll win. It never happened because the vote wouldn't come to the floor. But nonetheless, that's a really big difference. So, but to their defense, they put a lot of money in mental health. They uh, really, the largest amount I think we've ever put in. We have a lot of failures in the state. We have Rainier um, decertified. We have Western State Hospital decertified. So we literally have 188 patients that need to come to the community. And we don't have facilities for them. So uh, there's capital budget project request for Virginia Mason and Yakima. And we send a lot of our, well, Sheriff sends a lot of ours to Yakima, our patients who are mentally ill. And so they said, we want eight beds. So I said, I talked to Catholic Village, I said, I need eight beds for mental health. I know there's a lot of money being allocated for mental health. And they said, no, I don't think we can do that. But if you can take 12 beds, I'll give it to you. So literally, there's 12 new mental health beds going into Virginia yeah. Mason. But that's, that's the amount of money that they put in out of the budget. But that could have been used with the $4 billion. Right? So even the larger amount, we still wouldn't have had to go back to tax people to do that. There's a lot of social programs. There's a lot of, you know, money that we keep throwing at homelessness. And for me, that's really frustrating because homelessness is only growing. It's not going down. We're not seeing results. There's a documentary, Seattle is Dying. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's real. I mean, it's absolutely real. And there's meth addicts on there saying, all you have to do is go to Seattle. They don't have to see the laws. They don't have any power. And so, I mean, he's like, I love meth and I love Seattle because we can do whatever we want. And so you're seeing that. I mean, that's... You have officers resigning. Yeah, I, I would. It's too dangerous. Well, you, you know, have think? county prosecutors who are to fail declining cases and putting these people back out on the streets. Yeah. They've yeah. committed yeah. crimes. Yeah. Recommitting yeah. more crimes. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's, you know, if if we keep running, it, it, it's actually, it's, it's interesting because it's like a crystal ball, right? Seattle, mm -hmm. because if you keep running policies like that, you're going to get that across the state. And so we have to figure something out. So uh, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of, Work and money is going out to different programs. Again, you know, as Republicans, we want accountability. If you're going to spend a million dollars for an agency, show me what you spent the money on. Mm -hmm. And if they are not producing results, then take that money away and give it to someone who is. But to keep throwing money at all these social problems is not working. We're just making more problems. And we call it free Seattle instead of Seattle because basically people are coming there in droves mm -hmm. because there's so many free. And we just had someone at the last uh, tour stop say, you're giving immigrants everything. You're giving them housing and clothing and food. You're giving them all these different things, but you're not giving it to us who aren't immigrants. So I thought that was really interesting because it's true, right? Mm -hmm. we, we need to take care of our veterans. We need to make sure that we're doing great things for our own, and then work out from there. So it, it's, it's a very frustrating session, but that's a great question. And with four billion extra dollars, you could still keep every program running, you know, fund the Democrats' priorities, our priorities, and walk away. But now, ridiculous amount of taxes, which will only drive the cost of goods sold, it'll, it'll make more homelessness. You won't be able to stay in their houses because the cost of living is going up. So, yeah, it wasn't very fun. Yeah. Um, I heard just a little bit ago that the governor signed the state as a sanctuary state. I have, we've been that, on tour all day. That I would be, my phone I wonder if he signed the Keep Washington Working Act. So, yeah, I know, we should Google, do you know? He's our media guy. We'll look, I'll, so I think, I'm going to go with what Bill, I think, 
he signed in, which was called the Keep Washington Working Act, which on its surface sounds like some sort of shovel-ready jobs bill, right? Um, super positive, but the devil's always in the details. So this bill basically would prohibit local uh, and state law enforcement agencies and other agencies from cooperating with ICE. Um, and so this is where the emotion around the issue doesn't meet the logic of what it's going to do, right? So they, the Democrats on the House floor argue that we have people in this country living here illegally, that they're living in fear, that they're going to be deported, that they're not going to see their family, that X, Y, and Z. Well, immigration is a federal issue. It is not a state issue. So no matter what we do, they are still here illegally. And that fear will still be here because we are not, we don't enforce immigration stuff. Now, my comment to people was, if we do this, are we going to have another kid at Tass County sheriff situation where a sheriff was murdered by an illegal immigrant? Potentially. Why? Because we are prohibiting agencies from talking to each other. That is bad policy that directly led to an issue like 9-11. And we're going down that path again. And it, this is not, for, we're not saying, I'm not saying immigrants are bad people, illegal immigrants are bad people. I understand why they want to be here, but we need to, one, enforce our border, which is a federal federal issue, and two, make sure we know who's here so we can get bad actors out of here. And I argued that this wasn't a policy to make anyone safer, and I said I would go fight with anyone else in the State House and the State Senate, with our Congress, our congressional delegations, both um, in the House and Senate in D.C., and argue for immigration reform to fix the system. But we can't do that. So it's another false promise that's going to fix a problem that it won't actually fix the problem it's claiming to fix, and it's going to lead to other bad situations. We've seen the outcome of this type of policy in California repeatedly with people who have been deported three, four, or five times that are bad actors, that are not here because of the American dream of wanting to live a better life. And if we do this, we're, I'm worried we're going to have, you know, God forbid, another officer shooting or another civilian or anyone. Um, from people because we didn't have the tools necessary for communication and law enforcement. You know better than anyone else how detrimental this will be for for everyone. Oh, absolutely. Hey Chris, so I found, the, I found the article. This is from Associated Press, and it says, Washington is on track to become a sanctuary state, according, adding to a West Coast wall of states with such policies. Governor Jay Inslee signed a bill on Tuesday creating new rules. Police officers in the state will be restricted from asking about immigration status except in limited circumstances and the state attorney general will draw up rules for courthouses, hospitals and other government facilities aimed at limiting their use as hunting grounds for federal immigration agents. The rules expand on a 2017 executive order from Inslee which imposed similar requirements on only on state agencies. A move advocates said stop short of other sanctuary states which include Oregon and California. So that AP article glosses over the rulemaking authority that the Attorney General's office was given in this bill. Um, so it means they can do whatever they want once yeah. it gets done, once it's passed. So, so this, this, this is how ridiculous it is, and the, the immigration issue was a thread throughout many bills that you would never expect. So there was a bill in the Labor Committee, um, isolated worker. So mm -hmm. by the title, sounds great. If you have an isolated mm -hmm. worker, you should keep them safe. We all think that, right? Mm -hmm. But the bill said that you, um, if you are an isolated worker, so if you're in a hotel and you're cleaning rooms on one floor and um, you need help, that we have to provide you a panic button. So again, we were like, well, what's a panic button? I mean, is it an app on your phone? Most of my housekeepers have a phone in their pocket. Is it a siren who would hear it if they're isolated? You know, what does that even look like? And they said, well, they have to have this panic button and it has to alert a coworker. So I said, so are you saying that if someone's in trouble, being sexually harassed, being raped, being attacked, instead of calling law enforcement, they're supposed to call a coworker? And they said yes. And I said, well, first of all, they're isolated. So here at night audit, we, they may be the only worker at the desk, right? So does that mean they call me at my house or in Olympia or they call an assistant manager to come over and join the assault? How does that even, well, you have to provide that so that they can contact a co-worker immediately. And 
it was just it was just completely but I kept saying why would you not call law enforcement that makes no sense they're trained the co-workers not trained I don't want two people being attacked yeah. why why would that be and so finally after like six months of Ben and I racking our head going this is the most illogical bill they said well if we call law enforcement they're gonna send us back to the country I didn't even thought of that. <laughs> How but, often are law enforcement when they go to a scene? It's like, well, before I get involved, what's your immigration status? Yeah, exactly. 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 I but mean, it's almost that, laughable. But that, but that was the fear. Yeah. So well, I mean, you're trained to handle this. My coworkers, I'm not as trained as you are. Exactly. So. But if you look at how hypocritical the governor and the state attorney general is, they jumped all over me and other sheriffs. You, know, you have to follow the law, the rule of law. Well, the rule of law is the Constitution, by the way. But True. they talk out of both sides of their mouth. They beat up on your guns. Sanctuary city? Are they following the rule of law? Safe injection sites? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We, we want workers who work alone to be safe, yes. but they have to call law enforcement. So Absolutely. it's ridiculous. It's just frustrating, but that's, you know, that, that's the tone of session. We did that for 105 days. Wow. Yeah, and straight. The, the ACLU back in March of last year gave, um, uh, we had a meeting, Sasha Bentley was the one organizing it, and White Salmon, and the ACLU had nine policies they wanted the law enforcement to adopt. We were already doing one of those policies by state law, like you just mentioned. We don't ask them if they're illegally here on the call or anything. I mean, it surfaces at some point if they're booked and all that, but we don't ask them that. But the problem with, uh, with uh, well, I was going with the rule of law, now I get sidetracked on that, but anyway, it's frustrating when the ACLU wanted us to adopt these nine rules, and one of them was that if we had a homicide, and I got word from a a source said, you might want to check on Jose. Uh, he was bragging to his brother that he killed this girl. We don't have probable cause according to the ACLU. We, we were not to contact that person. How bizarre is that? Well, of course, you know what I told the ACLU on that issue. And then they didn't want us to allow ICE into the courthouse or into the jail. I said, no, I'll give them a red carpet treatment. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's bizarre. It's just yeah. Weird. If we keep doing what Seattle is doing, <clears throat> then we're going to be like Seattle. Exactly. We don't want to be. We don't want them. We don't want this, yeah. you know, lack of infrastructure with these influx of people. Well, how would I, how would I feel if we had an illegal in our jail, mm -hmm. and he's a bad actor, he's being looked at on. Uh, say a homicide, but somehow his drug buddies were able to w uh, raise money to bail him, even if it's a hundred thousand yeah, dollar bail. Yeah, a lot of money. I know he's going to get out. If I follow the ACLU's recommendation and sanctuary, I wouldn't say anything to ICE. I'd cut him loose. He'd bail out, and he'd be on the streets, and our citizens in danger of some bad actor, and. You know, I, no, I don't see that. Uh, somehow, I, and I don't know how it would happen, but I'm sure I should get wind of it and be there when he went to leave. But, you know. We just, we've, we've got to keep using logic in all these situations. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're familiar with this. I'm sure you guys have seen. So King County uh, Executive Dow Constantine forbade uh, Boeing Field from running ice flights. Um, for, so now they're flying out of the Yakima. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so now they're fighting that over here, and they're saying, you know, it's, it's not like a plane is sitting there and ICE agents are rounding up people. Right. These are people who have committed a crime, they've gone through the process that they are then deporting. It's not like they're just driving down the road, grabbing somebody, throwing them in a plane, and flying them out. Right. So, again, you miss the lot. We get on the emotion, right? We start, we roll down there. Emotion is important, and passion is important to have. But you have to understand the rule of law and the logic and reasoning behind what's being done. So, uh, I mean, if they come here legally, great. We want, we're all immigrants, right? Yeah, in a sense, yeah. but just do it legally. That's yeah. all we're asking. Yeah. We're not asking for anything other than that. So. Well, I think, I think really, there's a certain group of people 
uh, I'll use their initials, Democrats, that uh, that would want to see open borders because they believe in the long run that's going to help their party. Well, I can't speak to that, especially not in a uh, official legislative capacity. But um, we we've got, you know, again, it comes down to the fact is we're not the federal government. Right. We can advocate. We can look at reform. We but we need to know who's here. I have an obligation to make sure that, you know, we're doing, we're putting in rules and procedures that protect the people of the state of Washington. Yeah. So then um, it, it is our issue. Then. Yeah. So that. Over. So we. Well, we yeah. Because if we don't know who's here, let's say we have an illegal child molester. It's an illegal alien, and he's living next door and he victimizes a bunch of kids. First thing he's going to be asked, why didn't you guys know about this? Why wasn't he registered sex offender? Well, we weren't allowed to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I, I think there's a local problem that uh, it's a future problem that uh, I think we're going to need a lot of help. I think any rural community is going to have it. Our police department is small. Our sheriff's department is larger, but still small compared to other big cities. But the thing is, the hospital and the school system both are asking for security protection. And there's no, there's not enough officers, there's not enough budget. I wonder if that's something that could be addressed. I don't. I know there's not an instant fix, but well, there's. So we discussed. There was another bill that went through that um, was trying to address school resource officers from a training perspective. I don't think it really got into the funding issue, but I agree with you. Um, I have in the Yakima, in the Yakima Valley, we have West Valley School District and uh, Yakima School District. The Yakima School District has a uniformed police officer in every single middle school and high school. Uh, West Valley has Phoenix security. And I appreciate the security being there, but there's, that's different from a law enforcement officer. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how you would do a hospital, whether they'd have to budget it in there, but I know that the Yakima School District pays money back. So back to the, uh, the city of Yakima for that police service. So what happened before we got there, the year before, was we were on the floor and there was extra revenue again for the operating budget and what you can do is if you have a bill that didn't pass or something comes up after the whole legislative process you can introduce it and ask it to be put in as a budget proviso so like this year we had 864,000 that I was able to put in for veteran suicide to work on that and we'll stay we had 400,000 for domestic violence that we were able to put in the budget but what happened was last year was someone had introduced a bill because we had a surplus of money and we had extra money and we said we want a school resource officer in every school in the state of Washington. There's 30 million, and we had 30 million, and um, party line go. And so, nope, didn't go. So, I mean, it's, it's politics. Got in the way of really good policy to keep kids sure. safe. So, I don't know the answer as far as funding. Um, we can look into that and see. I know that there were, it's the wrong political climate to put law enforcement in basically anything, right? Yeah. So we're, uh, we're, we're trying, but if we call up something else, and then... Just, just quickly... Maybe it's posse. Yeah, just quickly. <laughs> uh, ideally, it would be an officer in every school. And I just did a real high ballpark, but it would be over a million and a half put them in our rural schools. And I didn't take in Goldendale, because you got law enforcement close by there. And our response time in the county could be anywhere from five minutes if they're right close, or it'd be a half hour before they get there, depending on where it was at. Bickleton, Glenwood, Trout Lake, any of those places. And what I propose, and I'm working with some of the school districts, uh, and some, some of them are gonna shudder, but armed teachers. Not all the teachers, the <laughs> superintendent or a, a teacher that's on staff, or a principal, or whatever. We send, we send them through firearms training, we qualify them, I commission them with a special deputy commission. We get them a psychological and a polygraph. They go through the whole gamut of uh, active shooter training, everything. Now, if a shooting goes down in that school, odds are they're going to know the school layout better than most officers that arrive on the scene. And they're, uh, they're going to be Johnny on the spot, they're right there. And if they can stop the shooting immediately, it's going to save lives. Now, I had to, uh, and I know some teachers are reluctant to do that. That's not our job. Well, our job is our kids. Right, and yeah. it says gun-free zone. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an it's yeah. a soft target. So, yeah. Yeah. so 
So we have it in Toppenish. They have our yeah. teachers. Um, I've had a couple conversations with people over there, and once you start explaining, see, once they start understanding what the situations are, yeah. we're not Seattle. There's not a, you know, five or six police vehicles within two minutes that could show up on scene. I said, if I've got a call out in Bickleton or somewhere else, we're lucky if it's a half hour. If that person, exactly. they were, they, you know, you just start explaining how the world works on this side of the state, and they're John's drunk. I mean, you know how many times I said, oh, I live over on the east side, and they asked what part of Bellevue I'm from, right? So, um, you know, the rural, rural um, wow. past living is the fact that you can't get Amazon Prime in two hours. I mean, they're like, oh, my gosh, how can you live? And I'm like, it's much better, actually. So, um, <laughs> so that I support it. Um, again, it's, it's, it's an optional thing. You want to yeah. make sure you have the right policies and procedures and want staff in there in place. Well, we have one school on board already. Good. Good. And they got policies, procedures. Are we allowed to put posse in schools? Uh, yeah. Volunteer posse well, members? Well, we can if it's armed for that reason. Uh, you'd have to probably get a buy-off from the school board. But I mean, they could get it. It would help not only security, because yeah. the shooter would know that there's somebody armed in school versus the right. gun-free zone. The second thing it would do is you know learn the layout of the school, because teachers are teaching. You yeah. don't know which teacher is going to be affected, and then also, you know, bullying. I mean, the, the consequences of bullying long term are devastating. Right. We've done so much work recently <clears throat> about kids that have been bullied for years, and then you know they end up harming animals, they end up doing sexual assaults, yeah. they rape. That I mean, they end up shooting from the top of a courthouse. Yeah. So I think it it could do a lot of things, and you have volunteer posse members oh, yeah. that I'm sure would go in and just get to know the kids, yeah. you know, yeah. watch for bullying, watch for somebody, and I don't know that we can't do that, you know? Oh, I, would, I, I don't know. I wouldn't have a problem doing it. Yeah, I'd do it. Even the, unarmed, you'd have volunteers that would probably walk in, get to know the kids, and make sure no bullying's going on, and make sure it's safer and no layout. Well, school. the unarmed, I'm, I'm not sure the school would have as much heartache with that, depending on some schools. Yeah. Sure. Well, I personally want to see the police officers in all those schools because you have you have a deterrent. Not, and I'm not the active shooter thing. That's that's one big threat. But there's a lot of other problems that go on oh, in yeah, schools, absolutely. whether it's drugs or gangs. Right. And and those that's a natural deterrent that can lead to better educational outcomes for these I would rather have full time commission officers in those schools. Oh, no, yeah, absolutely. When the tune of a million somewhere. and a half or two million dollar. Just be a mentor for those kids that yeah. need extra because yeah. the teachers are. Really slam with all these to get the funding for that is pretty good. Yeah. Other questions? Well, not questions so much as an observation. Um, I had the chance to get up to Olympia and spend a day up there, and I, I think uh, I, I would encourage anybody to, to do the same to go up to Olympia, because what you've heard described here is reasonable, sane people versus stupidity on steroids. <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> And, and I think I think to go up there, there's a difference between um, seeing the political machine at work when it thinks it's uh, it's oblivious to public notice. But when you're there and you can talk to somebody and they have to look you in the eye and talk to you directly and, and make a human contact and then try to settle the stupidity, it's a much bigger challenge. So I think it's worth it, the chance anytime you can to go there and spend time in Olympia and make your face, get your face seen, get talking to people find the right people to talk to about the right issues and hold them to hold them to task, take them to task. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll host you anytime we can. Yeah. I mean, we contact Ben or contact Gail and um, they'll set it up, but you're welcome to come up and just watch. We can put you in the gallery and you can watch action. I know that when he came up, he came up for the Native American Missing and Murdered Women Bill signing and he walked right into the press room with, with the governor and watched a bunch of other bill signings. And then we went to the Senate, and there was a tax palooza <laughs> demonstration that somebody had set up, and I don't know how many bills were on there. Did you ever see that? I got, a nice, I got a nice picture of that. Yeah, but I'm saying that you know you get to see how it works, the gears, and how it's turning, and where the frustration is, and you get to have, if you can also shadow for a day. Um, I just talked to Laura Cheney, and she wants to come shadow for a day. I mean, you can literally like. I could take you into caucus and introduce you to the, the Republican side, maybe even the Democrat side, I don't know. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you can sit in the wings, we can put you in the wings, and you can watch the votes, you know. You can be our guest for a day. We have people that do that. 
just so that they understand how it works. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for your work. Thank you. Can we see stupidity on steroids in the paper? You can. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you for all of your work. You've done amazing helping our county with lights and volunteering all that time. Yeah. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Ways to fix schools, ways to fix mental illness, opioids. I just had a comment. I don't know if I told you this last time we talked about the legislative ending. Um, what was really a, an interesting outcome with the teachers show, or not teachers, the hair stylist showing up, is that most of my in-laws are in that business. Some are rentals and some are salon owners. And one of the families um, are she's a Republican and he's a Democrat. And they were both in their corners until this issue yep. came in. And next thing you know, he's on board and he understands. What would be really interesting would be to figure out that pool of people who came in. You know, what was the outcome of that? How many... Yeah, we... Do you see where I'm... How many... Cross party line. Yeah. Work together. We yeah. talked to a lot. I talked to a lot of people who said I voted Democrat my entire life. I can't believe they would ever do something like this. And I said, this is the attack on individuals and business. Right. You just need to vote on the issue. Right. Yeah. You don't. You know. I think right. that if people read the bills and they follow and they <coughs> get engaged, you're going to yeah. vote on the issue. You don't have to be one side or the other because you're not always going to agree 100 percent Republican, 100 percent Democrat. It's, right. Yeah, I, would, I always up. recommend turn off. Just transcend it. Yeah. Everything. Yep. Yeah. Turn off one the mainstream media. It was everything. Vaccines, the same thing happened a little bit. We saw 900 people line up. Gun bills will come in at 6, 5 in the morning and see the line clear out to the parking lot. Anything that people unite behind, that was our power. That was our strategy because otherwise we didn't have the votes. But yeah. we could get the media. And the media was great about telling the story of what they saw and how passionate people were about the issue. And then you'll see my colleagues go, mm, maybe I want to run that bill. <laughs> you know, because they're getting 1,000 or 2,000 emails a day filling up their email and requests for meetings. And you can't even work when that's happening, right? Because you're trying to work on other things as well. So it's really important to, to hit that grassroots. And, it, you know, to get that issue out so people even knew about it, it was social media. Uh, Darcy, she's this amazing person, and she just hit every single site that she could that this bill was going on, and it was going to make it so... You had to be an employee, you couldn't be an independent con you know, she just told the story and it just went viral. I mean, literally within hours and then days and then the whole capital was filled. It was it was impressive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I I just wanted to say thank you for supporting the Centerville Grange. Um, we did get some of the capital budget funds in a grant and Again. Again, She's um, so good at this. I know, I know, I know. Um, but that's going to make the you know the Centerville Grange really be a, a building that many people can go to for multiple reasons: mm -hmm. funerals, weddings, right. to meetings, and it's going to be able to help Centerville, um, and then hopefully, ultimately, help Goldendale. Um, I wasn't personally involved in the funds for the Centerville Fire Hall, but that also is going to help because we have to um, take some of our trucks out of commission when they have to sit outside for the winter. So we have very limited trucks and with the new building we're going to have all of them in commission and we can react um, with all of the truck, the, the whole fleet. So that's wonderful. So I wanted to tell you that. And then I wanted to touch base on the education a little bit. You know, um, Centerville, I think there's two districts in the state that have not settled on teacher contract salaries yet. And um, it has been very, very hard to keep the school morale and climate going when the board members can't give something they don't have or can't give the salary dollars that they don't know how much it's going to be. Um, and the teachers don't want to make what Seattle makes. We know that it's a smaller community and such, but they also want to be respected. So the two sides have been working together to try and come to a solution, and we haven't yet. Um, the Hold Harmless is going to help. The one time I heard of $40,000 for Centerville School, which is going to make a difference, but it's one time. So how do we... Do we cover that over two years, thinking there might be some changes 
in two years again. We don't know. How do we hold on to that, you know? So um, it's been very hard. I think one of the things is that prototypical school model. That needs to be addressed for small schools because the SPED, which we don't, they don't come out of our budget because we're in a consortium, so that doesn't do anything. Counselors, we're too small, so our counseling money goes into SPED and then it's supposed to be funneled down. So really all of those things you talked about don't funnel down to a small school like Centerville. So I think the prototypical school model is where we need to start for the small schools. The other topic that you talked about, Gina, is um, where the dollars do go is the homeless, the McKinney-Vento homeless, the, uh, which we have none, um, migrant, zero, free and reduced, too low free and reduced numbers, um, minority, zero, um, so Centerville gets your no basic, basic, basic dollars, and that is it. None of the other funds that some of the schools, um, when Goldendale goes to play Mattawa, Wallach School District, and that big, beautiful food court in their high school, and those are all migrant dollars. So your schools that are too rich, but not rich enough, um, no migrant, no minority, no homeless, None of those special funds, categorical funds, nothing gets to our schools in, in Eastern Washington. And it's a huge problem. So I just wanted to comment on those yeah, things. But the big one is thank you. Thank yeah. you for supporting well, thank the Thank you for asking. Projects. They're just continuing that. What are they going to do? They might I'll say ask. no. I'll I had keep a, asking. Yeah, I had a ribbon cutting last week at High Prairie Fire Department. Mm -hmm. And that is a beautiful building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That has four bays. Uh, Dan Rhodes built it. Mm -hmm. The floor is beautiful. The concrete that came out of Tri Cities, and um, it's incredible. It's a really great project. It was about four hundred thousand dollars last year, and they just finished it. Mm -hmm. But you should go see it if, you, if there's a way. But they, it, the great thing was that there was a twenty-five mile radius where before they could get fire services, and we have a lot of fires out there, and they instantly with the wind take off to thousands of acres. And so not only did they get the fire department right in the middle where they needed it, all of the prop, all of the um, insurance went down of all the homeowners in the circle, and they were like, my insurance dropped, because all of a sudden they weren't paying really high insurance because the fire resource was so far away. So that was really fun. Yeah, they have an amazing system about, they're using um, storm water, off of the roof that goes into a system and stores, and then they're pumping it back up into the trucks. The trucks. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, just an incredible green system that's saving them money as well. And it's yeah, it's you have to go, you have to go see it. <laughs> Kevin, you have a question, right? Actually, yeah, I was kind of curious. Um, a lot of kids talk about minimum wage. You know, here we we can't afford to pay the hikes, and Seattle and King County is trying to put them in. Has there been any legislation in the state concerning minimum wage this year? So. Um, the only piece surrounding minimum wage was um, around uh, sub-minimum wage for disabled workers. Uh, there is current law where you can apply to get a permit uh, to pay sub-minimum wage for development of disabled people, and that is going away. Um, there wasn't anything else there. They want to keep raising that minimum wage up, thinking it's going to help people, but ironically, I had, even though minimum wage has gone up already, I had agencies coming into human services and early learning wanting us to now turn around and raise the poverty limits again to access their service because, quote, their clients couldn't access, they were getting, making too much money now. So, on the one hand, it's like, we want to give people more money, but then they were upset that they couldn't give them these additional benefits because they were then making too much money. So, um, there's no, you speak of political climate, there's no political climate to move that or adjust that. I think we need yeah. a training wage. Uh, I think we need potential uh, entry-level wages for teens. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't want to lose. So I'm not actually getting choked up, I'm coughing. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'm getting choked up. Um, we don't want to lose those entry-level jobs for people, especially for our, our young kids coming into the workforce, because that's a great place to learn you know, how to build valuable skills, like showing up on time. Who fight it isn't why he steals your money. All those things that you learn from getting that first job out there. So um, <clears throat> that was it. There was no push there, but I mean, it's going to come to a it's going to come to a boiling point at some point if we don't address it. Yeah. 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 Y
you know, we have legislation every year to do a teen wage or do a training wage or apprentice wage, and <coughs> they never move. I can get them out of the committee, the labor committee, with the knowledge that they're not going any farther just because they're nice. But it's not, it's not helping. And I think that they didn't push for a higher minimum wage because I think they did see in the Seattle area businesses leaving, so we can't afford this. So I think that they left it alone for a little bit, but they did change the minimum wage. The, the problem is, whenever we introduce those bills, and I've actually been one of them that introduces a teen wage bill, <coughs> um, because unemployment is higher high for teens, obviously. And we're having to pay that teenager who might be a freshman in high school you know, minimum wage, which is a lot of money for a beginner who has no skill set yet. And so the headline is always, um, Republican wants sub substandard wages. That's, that's the headline if I run the bill, which I've had the headline, so it's okay. But I'm just saying, until the political climate changes, you're not going to see those ancillary wages in order to get teens trained and build their resume, if nothing else. Build their skill set. Teach them a trade that they can use later on. <coughs> Good question. Yeah. <laughs> so, you said that uh, the danger is always in the rules writing. I totally agree. So when you have super stupid writing rules about things that they don't know anything about, what's worse is when it's not the legislature, it's these agencies like, say, the Department of Health. And they're writing things that are absolutely antithetical to giving any kind of care in rural Washington. Mm -hmm. How can we talk to these people? They will not listen. What, what can we do? Well, what we can do, is Senator Hennigford, my first year, said, don't ever let a bill go out that is not completely detailed. He said the, the worst mistake a legislator can make is to pass a bill that gives rulemaking authority. So it comes back to us, where we have to take ownership, <laughs> right. and we have to put everything we right. could possibly think of. That's why most of the bills we pass, like all of the bills I pass, it takes so much stakeholder work. Where we're just constantly listening to people, okay, what about that? And write that in the bill, write this in the bill. And, right. But that's the only way you can do it, because if it's not codified, then it gives these agencies, which live in Seattle and don't understand Eastern Washington, yes. the power to just make the bill so bad that I don't even want my own bill anymore. Yeah, right. We've killed, I've killed my own bill before after it's been destroyed in the Senate. Well, yeah, because I'm, I'm the uh, legislative liaison for my state association. And I haven't even had a chance to get to even talk to you people because I'm so busy just monitoring what the Department of Health is doing. Uh, and that's, that's how much crazy things that us fast and we can even respond to them. Yeah. Well, we can always help from our offices connect you to the right people when we're having those issues and set up at least be contacts to make sure that those, those issues are able to be sent to the right person. Because you know, you, you probably know better than most about what happens when you try to uh, get something done in a bureaucracy. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we need to write yes. better bills and so make sure we don't leave room. And then, right. you know, if you have a particular issue, then call Ben or call Gail. Rep. Corey's assistant. We're happy to. Oh, you do? <laughs> you do. Never mind. But, um, ben, do you already know? So, me? I'm <laughs> attending, so I'm attending the meetings and everything. And for example, the midwives asked the Department of Health to add some certain things that we needed into our legend drugs and devices that are part of our scope, but they're just not listed in there yet. Sure. And they've been telling us for years, we don't have the authority to do that. We don't have the authority to do that. We hear it over and over again. And yet they just put the entire CDC schedule of vaccines into our legend drugs and devices, and we only do maternity care. But none of that is even in our scope. What do we need that for? So you'll have to run and build and take it back out. Yeah. Well, so we can also run a bill to address scope. They scope were lying practice. about yeah. not having the authority, now doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, I was so talked to this individual and we'll just run legislation to reverse it out and then we'll have to have you come testify, for example, <laughs> to explain why so there's not a nexus between those two. Yeah, um, agencies speaking out of both sides of their mouth is very common. Yeah. I discovered that with the DNR <laughs> and Timberlands versus Rangelands. So. Anything additional? Anything we can help you with? One, We're going to do a legislative, or at least you're going to join me. You can. I, I do a legislative listening tour in December before I go back. So if you think of a great bill, you can call our office if you want something changed, you want something taken out or put in. Um, most of our bills will be all pre-filed by December. 
So any of the bills that I knew were going to be a two-year bill or I had to redo or stakeholder work or new people came up and opposed that I had to work through over the interim, those are already in line for next year. So uh, feel free to reach out anytime, email, call. There's so many um, ways to get a hold of us. Just one thing, real quickly. Um, I'd like to get with you guys at some point, not right now, because you've been a long day and you're tired, but uh, increasing the penalties on high-speed chases. Yeah. It's a low-grade C felony if somebody tries to get away. We had one the other day, just the last day or so. Yeah, sorry about that. No, <laughs> 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 so this, this young lady, 28-year-old, and a boyfriend who was a passenger, high on meth, oh, and admitted so. 90 plus, big chase went across the bridge, up Oregon side, back across the bridge, and ended up uh, putting it in a ditch in, uh, in Wish Run. But the point being is that it's a Class C felony. It's not much more than a gross misdemeanor. Yeah. And they had dangerous, and they had blowing stop signs, running people off the road. It could end up killing somebody. Absolutely. And it's no yeah. different if I stepped out and just willy-nilly started firing off shots. Mm -hmm. That's how irresponsible that uh, vehicle is. Uh, Why well, got over a ton of her. So you and, need to come testify on that. Yeah, yeah that's right. I'd be happy to. <laughs> yeah, I think I, that... I'd like to see it even raised to a Class A felony. Yeah, I, 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 committed, a I, um, I created a crime a couple years ago, and then I thought, this is, we can make these crimes, you know, we can do this. And then I was told two years ago that uh, Mosh Brecker, all I want to do is put people in jail and not run any <laughs> They're bad guys. You know, they yeah. want to let them all out. Yeah. And yeah. I'm trying to put them in, and they have all the votes. So yeah. we'll work on it. But oh, we'll have to I, really, really work on it right. now for December. Yeah, but I realize you're probably going to be up against the wall on that. Well, but, no, it's. But still, no, it's public it. safety. Yeah, run it anyway. You never know. Right. Never know. No, you're absolutely right. I, I did a ride with the county, Yakima County Sheriff, and we went through a high-speed chase, and yeah. I, was, I was afraid for my life. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of fun, don't get me wrong, but I mean, it's definitely not safe. So, but luckily this was at 2 o'clock in the morning, so that there was less people on the road, but... Yeah, and well, we have a policy, one to cut the chase off and so forth, right. depending on how severe the crime is. But, even at that, you got these people, I mean, they have no qualms about the public. They blow stop signs, red lights, and run people. They'll go over in the opposite lane of travel. Yeah. And uh, it's just crazy. Right have a big one in Seattle, and then jump right in behind it. That's right, that's right, then use that. Um, not to end on a, you know, a sour note, but um, I think that a lot of this comes down to personal accountability. We keep moving away and away and away and not holding people accountable for their actions and trying to, you know, allow them to make excuses and, and pass blame and, you know, let them off easy and, you know, I grew up in a house with tough love and I'll tell you what, that works. Yeah. So I think that... Um, yeah, me too, right there. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to speak for you, I assume, but you still, you still in it, Gina? Yeah, the, the notion of personal accountability yeah. seems to be going away and we need to be strengthening it because... You see that in yeah. jail. I mean, the inmates that we have in there. Uh, I was visited with seven of them last and week. And thank you for that, by the way. Yeah, that was a lot longer than I planned. Very educational. Yeah, it's a very good program she's got. For those that really Yeah, she's doing it. an amazing job. You should be really proud of her. The, the um, excuses about why they're there mm -hmm. were just really creative. Yeah. <laughs> I'll back to your point. Yes. It's usually somebody else's fault, and I, and I have to apologize. Your fault, you. actually. Actually, yeah. one, of, one of the best parts that I have to interrupt, but I said, um, I said so because they were, they were there on drug charges, some of, most of them, and felony. And I said, so do these signs deter you? You know, the sheriff signs? And they're like, yeah, we hate them, we hate the signs. And I said, so does it make it so you don't come to Clayton Tech County? And they said, um, no, it makes us, one of, them, one of them said, no, it makes us want to beat the system and get them anyway because the sign's there. Mm -hmm. And then the next one said, no, it's driving up the price of drugs here. We can't sell our drugs here. <laughs> so they <laughs> said, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, like, well, we're getting some effect, yeah, I thought, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was from the mouths of people who do it, yeah. so yeah. that's where the answers are. Can we get some budget money to... <laughs> Get more signs. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just got 200 in. Uh, <laughs> it's it's out of pocket. Pocket. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so, raise the money. Yeah, this is not this political climate, I guess. Oh, <laughs> Eventually, funny. you can yeah. spin this that is pendulum. For out of um, uh, investigating funds for narcotic right. investigation, right. public relations. So what we do when we get done with a search warrant on a house, we leave a sign there with the search warrant. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. A little gift. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for letting us serve.